Hi, my name is Connie Kalkarnas and you're watching a video on the characteristics of essential infantile esotropia. Essential infantile esotropia has various synonyms. You can also refer to the same condition when you use the term infantile esotropia or congenital esotropia. There has, however, been a move away from using the term congenital esotropia because it's very uncommon that an infant will have an esotropia at birth. It usually develops in the first six months of life. In relation to the etiology, the cause of the deviation, this remains relatively unknown to us. The literature does suggest that uh, a family history of strabismus is common in these children and that for some patients there appears to be a link between uh, low birth weight and maternal cigarette smoking. However, overall, the cause of this condition remains relatively unknown to us. In terms of the clinical characteristics of a patient uh, with this condition, we expect, as I just mentioned a moment ago, that the deviation will develop within the first six months of life. And this esotropia that you see will be large in size. It will be at least 30 prism doctors. And this esotropia can be considerably large. It could be 50, 60 doctors, for instance. Generally, there will be no significant refractive error. Now, as an infant, you're expecting there to be a level of hypermetropia, but that hypermetropia will be within normal limits. So you shouldn't find high levels of hypermetropia that are not expected at this age. Generally, abduction is also normal. So if we look at the example here, where we have the patient with the right esotropia, if we were to take the patient into right gaze, we should find that the abduction of the right eye is full. However, it's important to note that if you have a constant esotropia and it's not alternating, it's always the same eye that's deviating, what can happen is that medial rectus contracture can occur. So if you take a look at this child here, the eye is turned in significantly. And because of this, the medial rectus is contracted. With time, it can become quite tight which means that as this patient attempts to abduct, the tightness of the medial rectus will not allow it to fully abduct, in which case you'll see what appears to be a lateral rectus minus or an underaction of the lateral rectus. However, it's not the lateral rectus that's the issue, it's the medial rectus contracture that's not allowing the abduction of the eye. In this instance, usually when you commence occlusion for amblyopia, you'll start to see an improvement in the abduction and over time that should become full as you treat that amblyopia. The other point to make is because this condition occurs at such an early age, during a period of time where stereopsis is developing, they have a very poor prognosis for bifovial or BSV. This doesn't mean they don't have the potential of achieving BSV, it's just that it will be subnormal and it won't be bifovial. Infantile esotropia is also associated with a number of clinical features or signs. And I've listed them here. It includes cross fixation, inferior oblique overactions, DVD, uh, late nystagmus, nasal temporal asymmetry of OKM, and some patients may have an abnormal head posture. Now, the patient doesn't need to have all of these associated uh, clinical features. They may just have some. However, a large angle deviation with an early onset history with these associated signs gives you a clear diagnosis of essential infantile esotropia. Let's go through each of these associated signs. Commencing with cross fixation. What cross fixation means is that the patient alternates fixation at midline. So when they look over to the right, they use only one eye to fix with, and when they move over to the left, they use the other eye to fix with. Okay, so what we see here is the patient is looking over to the right. And we can see that the left eye is fixing on the target, and the right eye is not abducting. So they're choosing to fix with the left eye in right gaze. And in this instance here, the patient is being asked to look over to the left, and what we see is that the patient is fixing with the right eye and not abducting 
the left eye. So this gives you the appearance as if there is an issue with the lateral rectus or with the abduction of both these eyes. But indeed, it's simply what's called cross-fixation. To confirm that the lateral rectus is functioning and that abduction is full, what you need to do is cover the eye, so you would cover this eye here, and then monocularly ask the patient to abduct the eye. So you're assessing the ductions. You would do this uh, for both eyes. Now there is some suggestion that this protects patients from developing significant amblyopia. Because as you can see, when they're looking into right gaze, they're using the left eye, and when they're looking into left gaze, they're using the right eye, which is almost like an alternating patient. However, it's not completely preventative, so don't assume that just because you see cross fixation, there is no amblyopia present. An infantile OT can also be associated with inferior oblique overactions. It could be either just one eye overacting, or one inferior oblique overacting, or both inferior obliques overacting. If we take a look at the image here of the patient who has um, an infantile esotropia, this is the patient in right gaze, and this is the patient in left gaze. And we can see in right gaze that the left eye is elevating due to the inferior oblique, and if we were to assess the patient in dextral elevation, we would have confirmation also of that inferior oblique overaction. Here over to the left, again, the right eye now is elevating due to the inferior oblique overaction, and if we assess the patient in labor elevation, we will find an overaction of the inferior oblique. Now, one of the issues with the inferior oblique overactions in patients with infantile esotropia is that it can be confused with dissociated vertical divergence, or DVD. And it's important that the orthoptist distinguish whether the patient has an inferior oblique overaction or DVD or both. Let's talk more about what actually is DVD. DVD is a condition where the eye elevates when the amount of light entering that eye is reduced. So if we take a look at the patient over here to the right, we can see that we have a Spielman occluder over the left eye and the left eye has elevated under the occluder which has reduced the light entering through that eye. And over here when the Spielman occluder is over the right eye, again we're seeing an elevation of the right eye. Now the elevation of the right eye is not as high as the elevation of the left eye. So the DVD here is asymmetrical. It's larger in the left eye as compared to the right eye. Now for some patients, you may not observe the DVD in both eyes, but it is generally considered to be a bilateral uh, condition that can be asymmetric. Now DVD is part of what's considered to be the dissociated strabismus complex. So it consists of a number of dissociated strabismus. And here I've listed that we have dissociated vertical, dissociated horizontal deviation and dissociated torsional deviation. What this means is that with a dissociated vertical deviation, what we have is the eye elevating um, with reduction of light. Dissociated horizontal deviation means that there is a horizontal deviation when light is reduced. And dissociated torsional deviation is that when light is reduced, we see a torsion of the eye. Now, often with patients with DVD, what we see is a combination of all those three things. So we see the eye elevate, abduct slightly, and excyclotort taut as it goes up. And when the cover is removed, what you'll see is the eye come down, in taut, and adduct on return to its original position. So in the past, DVD, or the term DVD, was utilised to describe all those three things. But now, often a distinction is made between DVD, DHD, and DTT. Let's have a look at another example of a patient with DVD. So here we have the example we just saw where we've got asymmetrical DVD. However, for this patient here, we can see that the right eye is not only elevated, but it's abducted out. So we have both DVD and DHD here. And if we look here, we can see that in this instance, there is more DHD rather than DVD. 
So here we see a greater example of a patient having both DHD and DVD. Unfortunately, with images, we can't see whether there's also a dissociated torsional deviation. But what we can see here is that there can be significant asymmetry between the two eyes, and that dissociated strabismus complex encompasses a vertical, horizontal, and torsional movement, and that patients will vary in their presentation. Now, in terms of recording, most orthoptists would actually still record both of these conditions as DVD. Some orthoptists will actually distinguish that there is DHD and DVD here and would comment on whether they see DTD. For now, it's appropriate for you to just record this as DVD when observed. Now, before moving on, I want to mention a couple of things. One is that the DVD is rarely present at the time of the diagnosis of an infantile esotropia. DVD doesn't develop till later on, usually around two, three years of age. The other thing to point out, which is a very important point, is that DVD defies the laws of innovation. What does this mean? If you can see here, the left eye is elevated under the occluder. Now, when the occluder moves over to the right eye, what we should see is the right eye going down. Why? Because this eye is about to take up fixation, and in order for it to take up fixation, the eye will move down. As you can see here, it's moved down as it's moved over to the other side. And as that eye moves down, due to Herring's law, this eye should move down along with it, which means this eye should be hypertropic. However, what we see here is that the eye elevates instead. So we have an alternating hyperdeviation. And an alternating hyperdeviation defies Herring's law and is a classic sign of a patient who has DVD and not simply a vertical deviation. This is particularly important to make the distinction when DVD spontaneously manifests. What can happen is that sometimes over time, the DVD will present itself with both eyes open. So it doesn't need the reduction of light in order for the eye to be deviating up. In other words, what you end up with is a manifest strabismus that's vertical in nature. And so the patient will present with, say, for instance, an esotropia and a left on right. And you'll need to work out if that left on right is DVD or whether that left on right is just a vertical deviation. And if you do see alternating hyperdeviation, well, that gives you the indication that this is DVD. Now, if you're in doubt as to whether the vertical deviation is due to DVD, then we can look for what's called the Bilchowski phenomenon. This confirms the presence of DVD. And the test that we do to elicit the Bilchowski phenomenon is called the Bilchowski darkening wedge test. And so we use uh, the Spicer bar or the Bagalini filter bar. You could also use a neutral density filter bar because in both these instances, we're getting a reduction in the light that's entering through the eye. Now, what you do is you occlude the eye that um, has the DVD and the eye under the cover will obviously be elevated. You then introduce the Bagalini filter bar in front of the other eye, the fixing eye, and you start off with the very first or the lightest filter. And you progressively increase the filter. And what you'll see is as you increase the filter, you'll start to see the eye come down. So the eye progressively moves down as you decrease the illumination. This is called the Bilchowski phenomenon and it confirms to you that this is DVD and not a vertical deviation. Other types of vertical deviations do not respond this way. They don't have that relationship between illumination and deviation. Now I mentioned earlier that as an orthoptist we need to distinguish whether the patient has a DVD or an inferior oblique overaction. And here we have a table by Anson's and Davis, which gives us the diagnostic features that assist us to determine whether the patient has DVD or uh, simply an inferior oblique overaction. Let's just quickly go through these. 
With DVD, the elevation is progressive in nature. It's not as constant in terms of size and degree as it is with an inferior oblique overaction. And with DVD, when the eye comes down, you see in torsion, but this doesn't happen with an inferior oblique. Now, this is assuming that you have DTD in addition to the DVD, but usually uh, there is some torsion as, as the eye comes down. In terms of ocular movements, here we have elevation under uh, cover, equal in all positions of gaze. So once the DVD is present under the cover, if you have the patient in abduction or adduction, you will see that the eye is still elevated. However, with the inferior oblique, the greatest elevation is in adduction where the action of that extraocular muscle is. When you take the eye into abduction, you're actually going to be looking at the superior rectus, and, and that's not an issue uh, generally, so you won't see the deviation of the elevation in that position. Sometimes with DVD, it may become manifest on versions, and this happens when the nose actually blocks the view of the patient as they move into right gaze or left gaze. Sometimes you'll see a spontaneous elevation of the eye due to DVD and due to the blockage of the nose. Okay, with um, DVD, usually you'll see A patterns and inferior oblique overactions, you usually see V patterns. And if there is a superior oblique under or overaction, it's usually an overaction uh, in DVD and usually an underaction in uh, inferior oblique overactions. Okay, the next one we have here is late nystagmus. Uh, where there's DVD, there's usually late nystagmus. And these two are also associated with infantile isotropia. Late nystagmus is, is less frequent where there is only an inferior oblique overaction. Okay, and finally, with the Bilchowski phenomenon, obviously this will be present um, if you have DVD, but absent if you have an inferior oblique overaction. Latent nystagmus also often occurs with DVD uh, and inferior oblique overactions, and it's commonly associated with infantile strabismus. Now, latent nystagmus is nystagmus that is elicited with the occlusion of one eye or upon dissociation. Let's have a look at the child here to the right who has both late nystagmus and DVD. Now what we'll see is as uh, the orthoptist covers the left eye, we'll see a small oscillation of the right eye. And there we go, we can just see a small oscillation there. And now let's take a look at that left eye, small oscillation there. Let's now have a look at the DVD. What I want you to look at is the right eye as the cover is removed. Now remember with the DVD, it will have been elicited under the cover. So the right eye will be elevated under the cover with the reduced illumination that the cover has caused. So when the cover is removed, what you'll see is the eye coming back down from its elevated position. Let's have a look at that. And there you saw the eye coming down from that elevated position. That is DVD. And if you wanted confirmation that that was DVD, you could also look for the Wilczowski phenomenon. I should point out that many of the textbooks talk about latent nystagmus as being a nystagmus that is only present when covering one eye. However, it has been found that these patients also do have a manifest component to their deviation. It's just that it's so fine that you don't observe it clinically when both eyes are open. However, if you were to do an eye movement recording, you would find the manifest component of the nystagmus. Moving now on to optokinetic nystagmus. In patients with an infantile esotropia, because the strabismus develops during a period where we develop symmetry of OKM, the disruption that's caused by the strabismus leads to asymmetric OKN. Now we assess OKN using something like the OKN drum, which we can see here. And what we'll find is that when the stripes are moving temporal and nasal, we'll have a normal response. But when the stripes are moving nasal to temporal, there will be an abnormal response. Let's take a look at the video here to the right, and let's assume that we're assessing the right eye. So we've covered the left eye. 
Here we would be having the stripes moving temporal and nasal, where we would have a normal OK in response. And now we would be assessing nasal to temporal, where we would see the abnormal response. And this would either be no OK in would be observed, or where any regular type of OK in would be observed. Now, some patients with an infantile esotropia may also have an abnormal head posture, such that they'll turn their head or, or tilt their head. If we look at this patient here, they've turned their head to the right, and it seems like they've tilted it slightly to the right as well. This is usually secondary to either nystagmus, DVD, or an inferior oblique overaction. So what they're trying to do is achieve um, either an improvement in visual acuity, such as with um, nystagmus, or they're trying to achieve BSV. Now, before we conclude, I just want to mention a couple of things. One is that it's important to differentially diagnose an infantile esotropia from other conditions. If a patient presents to your clinic with a large angle esotropia that's developed under six months of age, you can't assume that it's an infantile esotropia. You have to exclude other conditions as potentially being the cause for this esotropia. And the four main conditions that we consider is a congenital six nerve palsy, Duane's retraction syndrome, nystagmus blockage syndrome, and early onset accommodative uh, ET. Now, the nystagmus blockage syndrome we've talked about, and the early onset accommodative to ET are your fully or partially accommodative esotropias that occur early, in other words, under six months of age. Now, this is uncommon. Most develop later on um, at about two or three years of age. However, there are some patients who develop these accommodative esotropias early on. And the greater the hypermetropia that an infant has, the more likely it is that they have an early onset accommodative esotropia. With the congenital six nerve palsy and the Duane's retraction syndrome, we'll learn more about these next um, semester. But with the congenital six, you'll end up with an esotropia in primary position and you'll have a lateral rectus underaction. A bit like we see here, an esotropia in prime position and a lateral rectus deficit. With the Duane's retraction syndrome, in some patients, not all, you may end up with an esotropia that's large in primary. And what we'll see is a deficit of abduction or adduction, and we'll see lid changes. And the patient down here actually has Duane's retraction syndrome. And what we see here is that we have the esotropia in primary, the abduction deficit in left gaze. And what we can also see is palpable fissure changes. So the palpable fissure here is smaller than when the patient's looking here. So there's a widening on abduction. And we can also see that there is a narrowing on adduction. In any case, all these patients may present with an esotropia under six months of age. So it's important that you distinguish between these conditions and next semester we'll learn more about those conditions. The last thing I want to mention is that you can have an essential infantile exotropia, which is an exotropia that develops under six months of age. However, this is very, very rare. It's, it's uncommon to see an infantile exotropia. Most patients, almost all patients, have an essential infantile esotropia. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.